Aloha, welcome to Fast and Ona Cooking. My name is Lonnie Taylor and I'm an AARP volunteer. Tonight I am your host. Tonight we will be continuing our trip around the world to the Mediterranean. There is 21 countries that surround the Mediterranean and tonight we'll be um, uh, making an herb Herb, um, making Herb de Provence. A, it's a Mediterranean, a popular Medi Mediterranean spice blend, and we'll be using it in, in the Cosalet. Um, on behalf of our sponsors, Kaunoa Senior Services on Maui, and Uala Leaf Cafe at the Windward Community College, and AARP Hawaii, welcome. Just kidding. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, Thanks for the uh, introduction, Lonnie. Appreciate it very much. Um, tonight we are doing, as um, Lonnie mentioned, the cassoulet, which is a popular dish uh, in France. Uh, the dish actually is sort of southwestern France. Uh, the herbs de Provence that we'll talk about is more of a southeastern uh, French thing around Nice and the regions between there and uh, Marseille. Um, the French Riviera, so to speak. Um, but it's a blend of a lot of different herbs that we'll talk about here. Um, and then the cassoulet uh, is pretty versatile. We've got some core ingredients here and I uh, sent a recipe out that has a bunch. Uh, well, it has, it has the primary ingredients in there and then a recommendation for things that you can substitute as well. Um, so feel free to ask question, uh, questions as we go through this. I went to school in France when I was like when I was 20 years old, 21, as an exchange student. So I was in the Southwest. Um, and this was one of the dishes that was first introduced to me uh, by the family that I was staying with. So this and the uh, poulet po, uh, which I thought about putting on this on this menu, that just means uh, chicken of po. It's a dish from uh, po, the, the city that I studied in. But um, we went with something a little bit more well-known, which is a cassoulet. So like a, a, a braised, uh, meat and sausage stew is really all it is. So um, what we'll do is talk about the ingredients and uh, uh, that are in the herbs de Provence and then also the ingredients that are in the dish itself. Um, looking at the timeline tonight, I'm like, oh, I think I have time to do um, some Brussels sprouts. Uh, so I saw some at the store and I'm like, oh, I'm going to add those in. I think we can get those done. I mentioned last week that uh, Alice and I had done them in the air fryer. Uh, thanks, Cindy. For donating this to the to the program we were borrowing this and using it at home and we're going to do um, a brussels sprout dish uh, really quickly uh, about halfway through hopefully it'll turn out if not i mean it, it's just a bonus anyways right <laughs> uh, so anyways if you look at um, the primary you know cassoulet components it's not complicated at all it, it's like a lot of your stews that you would find um, so there's usually a sausage or meat. Oftentimes it's duck. We don't do a lot of duck in Hawaii. We tend to work with chicken more. Um, if you're working with duck, it's probably, or if you're eating it, it's probably the Chinese style duck. So if you get the whole duck and you have those bones, or if you want to use the shredded duck meat uh, in place of, in this case tonight, the shredded uh, chicken, uh, you can add that in bones and everything. It's up to you whether you like uh, picking the bones, but that would work also. So as long as there's some form of a sausage, and I've got uh, two kinds here. One is a chicken, well, they're both chicken, but one is a chicken apple and one is just uh, a regular spicy chicken sausage. Uh, vegetables, always garlic and onions in there. I'm adding celery tonight. Uh, I actually saw these great little uh, sweet bells that were on sale when we were at the, the store. So I grabbed those. I might throw them in here with the cassoulet or I may actually even throw them in with the Brussels sprouts. Uh, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll, we're just making it up as we go, right? <laughs> uh, and then white beans, it's usually always the bean that goes in. A can, uh, uh, cannelli bean, you get white navy beans. There's uh, a wide variety of beans um, that are on the white bean side. But you know, honestly, if you, if you have a can of uh, pinto beans or kidney beans or something at home, or if you're soaking and cooking your own beans of choice. You know, honestly, you can add whatever you want. Just traditionally, it would be uh, a white bean. Uh, and then we've got uh, canned tomatoes. That certainly could be fresh. I've said before, I just, I love the convenience of a canned tomato and the fact that they're always extremely flavorful. So you're kind of hit and miss these days, it seems like with the 
uh, tomatoes, even the ones I've picked up at the farmer's market, uh, don't always have that beautiful, robust tomato flavor uh, that I always get with a tried and true uh, peeled, stewed uh, tomato in a can. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with using the fresh. So, and then the last part I have on here is just the herbs de Provence. And that's not, uh, it's not a common one. We're not actually mixing it tonight. And uh, here's the reason why. I hope you guys can like see this. Let me, let me put it here. So is the reflection blocking it? Let me see, I don't know. I, let me take, oh, I had it. Let me take it out of this. I was trying to be fancy. Uh, but you can see the, the abundance of herbs that go into it. Now there are some core herbs that are almost always in it in terms of like the rosemary, uh, the savory, thyme, basil, marjoram, oregano, tarragon is generally in it. Um, and bay powder, which is just a ground bay leaf. You could of course throw in a bay leaf bowl and take it out at the end and you get the, the flavor from it as well if you're making your own blend. Um, and then some optional ones in terms of, uh, I listed just a few, uh, fennel, uh, lavender. I tend to use that if I'm making this myself because I like the flavor of the lavender flower. It's usually ground, dried and then ground. Um, and then Italian parsley. Now tonight we're gonna put the Italian parsley in fresh at the end. Um, but most of these should be pretty common to everyone with the exception maybe of the dried lavender flowers. We don't see that or see it used a lot in Hawaii. Uh, in California, when we lived there, you'd see it growing on the side of the road. And I'd always stop and pick it because it can be actually pretty expensive, but it's very beautiful. It's purple and people use it as an ornamental and it works great. You just clean it, dry it and grind it up and you use it for soups and stews and herb blends and ice creams or whatever. Um, the other thing that might not be as common is the savory. Uh, that's, it looks like rosemary, um, so a little bit peppery. Uh, there's a summer savory and a winter savory. It grows in the Mediterranean region that we're, we're talking about for the herbs of Provence, but um, the summer one is a little bit more spicy, a little bit more peppery, uh, and the winter one's a little bit more mild. So I have not seen that for sale in the supermarkets here. Some folks may be growing it. You may be able to get the plants or the seeds at the um, farm store, but uh, the easiest way to deal with this particular blend, because there are so many, is to just pick up the herbs of Provence. And you'll find this in every supermarket. This is a little bit larger container than you probably need. Uh, this is the one that we have in the kitchen, uh, but they do the small jars uh, in the supermarket and it has all of them blended for you all ready to go. So it's really, really fragrant, uh, nice and light. Uh, like the French version of Italian seasoning. And it can be used across a number of dishes, not just uh, the dish that we're making tonight uh, with the cassoulet. Uh, so feel free to ask questions if you have them uh, about the, the herbs and I'll go ahead and get started here. I just have the cast iron skillet. I was gonna use the pot from last week because it has the glass lid, um, but it steams up and doesn't necessarily give us the view that we want anyways. I'll just remove the lid. Uh, of the cast iron one. So any heavy bottom uh, sauce pot would work as long as it holds the ingredients that you have that are going into it. All right, and then I'll start with a little bit of olive oil. I've already kind of warmed it up, so it should be a little bit hot. Hopefully not too hot. We don't want to overdo it. So and I'm gonna, yeah, go ahead. So Chef Dan, you probably already answered this question, but uh, Lori wanted to know what is dried savory? Yeah, all of the herbs that we have here when you talk about dried savory, they're usually always sold in two forms. Dry is one form or uh, fresh is the other. Uh, so your dried ones can be either ground or they can be uh, whole leaf, like basil you'll see in whole leaf or you'll see basil powder. So all of those items are just herb blends that are dried and ground. So if it says ground lavender, it would be dried ground lavender. If it says that about sage, same thing. If it says it about savory, same thing. So we're just looking for, and it's up to you, we're looking for the dried version. If you have all of these growing at home, oh, that would be amazing. Uh, feel free to, to use the fresh ones, but you'd wanna chop them up. Um, the dried ones though are almost always uh, in two forms, the ground or the whole leaf. 
And then I just threw in the sausage. I've got uh, one of them in there. The other one I'm going to cut, and I'm just cutting these into rings. Uh, if you wanted to cut larger pieces, you could. It's totally up to you. Uh, I kind of like to go bite-sized pieces. And this can be raw or cooked. I blanched this one just, just a little bit so it'll be a bit more firm. Sometimes if you're, oops, if you're dealing with raw sausage, uh, Italian sausage or chicken apple sausage, when you go to cut it, it can kind of smoosh out. But if you just blanch it really quickly, it'll firm up, chill it in ice water, and then it'll slice better into little rings. And just again, Amy wanted to know, are the herbs in Herbs de Provence from the grocery store the same as in your mixture? Yep, absolutely. Uh, this particular brand may be in the supermarket uh, gourmet collection, but you know, there's a lot of different spice companies out there and they all probably produce their own version of Herbs de Provence. It's not super popular, like I said, in Hawaii, but uh, it is a great blend, and I know you can find at least a couple different variety or uh, manufacturers or, or brands of it in the supermarket. You know, McCormick's the the big brands always have that. So I've got the sausage. I'm just going to add the garlic, and I chop that. Um, there's a couple ways to do it. You can just take your peeled garlic cloves and do kind of a rough slice, and then a couple more chops, which is what I did earlier. And then another technique, which we've shown you here, I think a couple times on the show, is just to take uh, the stem part off. And then you, you put your knife or a skillet or a spoon or something flat over it and just give it a little crush and it smashes it. And then that makes the cutting a little bit easier. You don't have to come back because you've crushed it, releasing the aromas and the oils and then a couple slices and you're good to go. I do have a question from Holly and regarding the lavender flowers. Are they the French ones? Because several of the lavender plants, Spain, et cetera, they all look different. Yeah, there's actually numerous types of lavender. Uh, I don't know the specific species or uh, genus. Maybe Alice can look it up and put it in the, uh, in, in the chat. But there are the purple flowers and they're tight little bunches. It almost looks like a, a corn cob in a way. Um, we have at home Spanish lavender, and it's maybe not as compact, and oftentimes they use the leaves, and it looks like rosemary, in a sense, on a stalk. So there's a few different ones out there, and you can often buy that dry and ready to go as well um, by itself. But I, like I said, I don't see that a lot in Hawaii. Here I'm just chopping the celery into small pieces. If you want a heartier stew, you can keep the pieces a little bit bigger, up to you. I've got this kind of on medium high heat because we're always a little pressed for time, but you should be able to see that we're getting a little bit of caramelization taking place. See if I can move this without burning my hand. <laughs> Try to show you a little bit. But you can see the color. Try not to steam up the lens. You can see the color forming on the onions, uh, the caramelization from the meat. And that's one of the things that we really look for is to develop that flavor. And that's why you want a nice thick pot. You don't want a, something really thin aluminum or a thin steel pot because um, what ends up happening is you end up burning your product. I'm gonna turn this on just to allow it to heat up. See if it goes, I set this at 400, which is as high as this particular model goes, and um, that's what we'll use for the Brussels sprouts, but I'll let them heat up for just a second. And then uh, the, the other ingredients that I have that will go into this is a little bit of water. Uh, I've got the herbs that we'll chop at the end. I don't know if you guys want me to put in a pepper. Actually, I think I'm going to just do it. Put one in really quick. I'll take the seeds out, and these are sweet, so they're not spicy hot. If you wanted some heat in your cassoulet, you could add, easily just throw in a Hawaiian chili or whatever your favorite chili is. Some chili flakes would work. Uh, or you could put a hot sauce on the table and allow folks to make the decision for themselves. But these are really, really nice and they're fresh. So I want to just dice one up a little bit. Small, small dice. 
So while you're dicing, Jan wants to know, is it necessary to include beans? Some folks have allergies. Is it necessary to add what? Beans. beans? No, absolutely not. Hopefully, if you don't take anything away from our, our programming, um, the one thing you'll take away is that you have the freedom. In the kitchen, you're the, you're the boss. Anything that you want more of or less of or not at all, you can just make that adjustment. Uh, we like to kind of focus on the technique. So uh, here, this is basically like a braise and we've done that numerous times. So absolutely feel free to leave those out. Okay, and then on the onion, I've got enough onion in there, I think, but I was just gonna show you the technique that I use. If I'm doing onions uh, for a dish like this, I'll, I'll cut the ends off, I'll remove the skin, I'll cut it in half. And then I'll usually do a couple slices here, depending on the size I'm looking for, turn it, and then I sort of follow the contour where here I can work my knife around. And as it comes together, you end up with pretty even cuts that end up the same size. Now, if I want a julienne, like we're gonna use for the Brussels sprouts, I'd go the opposite direction, I'll show you that. And by the way, Mary wanted to find out, um, did you put, um, uh, let's see, EVO, or butter in first before the onions, yeah. then yeah. the sausage? Yeah. The recipe, I have two tablespoons, it's up to you. You can do a light spraying uh, of it if you have a cast iron skillet or, or a little bit of butter or your favorite oil for cooking. If you have a good non-stick pot, like the one that we used last week, uh, you don't even need oil, honestly. Um, you've got some fat in the sausage that will probably bleed out a little bit into the, the pot. So if you're watching your fat intake, you can monitor it a little bit by uh, choosing the oil that you use or the amount that you're putting in or the sausage that you're picking. So, all right. And then as that starts to brown nice, great caramelization now, you can see the color is nice and brown. Uh, I'm gonna throw in the herbs in Provence. That's gonna give me a little bit of aroma that'll start to, loop. the oils will come out of there. I'm gonna hit it with a tiny bit of this water. If I were at home and I had a little bit of red wine or white wine or leftover uh, champagne or any sort of uh, spirit like that, actually a spirit would work good, a wine, but uh, if you have a little red wine or white wine, you can throw it in at this point and deglaze the pot. And that'll release the pond or that caramelization on the bottom and creates a little bit of a sauce. So it also steam that up and then that's coming along good. While that's going, let me take this bowl. We'll add these at the end because these are already cooked. They just need to be heated up basically. So I've got these Brussels sprouts and all I did was cut them in half, removed any leaves that were uh, misshapen or falling off or had uh, marks on them from bugs or anything and split them right down the middle. And then here's the julienne I was talking about. This is where you just cut that onion end to end and you end up with a, you know, a nice julienne piece. If you can see that a little bit better. And uh, it's very similar, it just gives you a longer piece. That's what's used for French onion soup and a lot of dishes like that. I saw some cremini mushrooms at the store, so I grabbed those. I've got again, a little bit of that savory I'm gonna put in here and a little salt and pepper, not a lot, and a tiny bit of oil. Now, uh, air fryer is designed to, for the most part to help us stay away from frying, right? That's the whole purpose of it. And it is, uh, like we've talked about before, nothing more than a convection oven, but really heavy circulation. Uh, and they do work well. I wish this one went up a little bit higher, but that's okay. It works pretty good for what we've got. I'm gonna hit this with a teeny bit more oil just because it's kind of a big batch. And make sure that it's nice and coated. I have a couple of questions. Of moisture left over from washing those Brussels sprouts. So there will be a tiny bit of water in there, which will probably help us in what we're looking at doing here. So I'm just gonna remove this, dump it in. This is a lot. At home, we usually only cook for the two of us. So I'm thinking in about 10 minutes, that should be 
Uh, we got nine on the timer, so let's see how it goes. If we end up with smoke bar <laughs> barreling out of it, we know we went too long. Okay, now this uh, looks very close to being ready. Most of that liquid, that teeny bit that I put in evaporated. So I can add, I'm gonna just add half of what I have left. In the recipe I put, it's up to you to decide the thickness you want. I'm gonna add those tomatoes. And that was about a 14 ounce can of tomatoes. Uh, two of the cans of beans. Actually looking at that, I think I am gonna add all this liquid. So you didn't drain um, the beans before adding them? That's a great question. Uh, traditionally, it is drained, I think actually even in writing the recipe today, uh, or excuse me, this uh, last week or the week before when I wrote it, uh, I put rinse the beans and you can, but uh, because I'm making a stew and I don't wanna have to thicken it, uh, as I opened it, I tasted the, the, that little bit of liquid that's in there and I decided I wanted to keep it in. So that's sort of up to you. And that will act almost like a thickening agent of sorts um, as we get that going. I'm gonna throw these peppers in here actually, quick. You know, you mentioned um, wine. Uh, Lori doesn't drink wine, uh, but they drink sake. Would sake work? Oh, absolutely. And think of the flavor profiles that we have going on here. Clearly, this is a Mediterranean, and we've got the Mediterranean herbs. Um, we've got the beans that are traditionally used there, you know, the type of sausage. But you could make this same dish with, uh, a Japanese flair. If you were to use sake instead of red wine, uh, you might use a, a good black bean can be uh, somewhat popular in Japanese cuisine. You could use a little bit of miso uh, paste in there. You could use uh, a fish like salmon or, or any type of shrimp in, in place of the sausage or, or even just get a seafood sausage. You still got the water that's going in. You probably wouldn't use the the tomato, but you might use zucchini. Uh, so you could really play around with the different ingredients and just substitute them out. And you would end up with, you know, a Japanese version of this type of stew. So there probably is one actually out there already. So I, I'm not gonna add the chicken uh, right now, just cause this chicken's cooked already. Uh, when uh, we had chicken yesterday, and it was just roasted. I took the skin off of it. These were thighs, but you can use breast. You can use, uh, like I said earlier, the duck that you might have if you order duck um, from Chinatown or if you're picking it up at one of the, we, we pick ours up at uh, times in, I guess on the, at the bottom of the leaky leaky. Uh, they have a great duck. So any of those things would work in there. But if it's cooked already, all you wanna do is heat it up. So I don't have to worry about beans getting overcooked. I don't have to worry about those tomatoes necessarily getting overcooked, but I, I do have to worry about chicken getting overcooked. If I add this in and it boils for a long time, it can become dry. So we talk about that all the time. So since it's already been roasted and, and then it was left over, I just peeled the meat off, I shredded it up and it's gonna just go in right at the end, just enough to heat it before I serve it and it'll be fine. And then I've what got, the, uh, yep, go ahead. What is the temperature for the air fryer? I turned this one up as high as it would go, 400. So they may go, uh, I don't know the different brands. This is the only one I've uh, worked with before. But as I said earlier, I would prefer if it went up to like 425, even 450 to give me the option. But this particular one maxes out at 400. So uh, it has a bunch of different settings. It's like everything in life for me, it's, it's, it's more technical than I need, right? I just need the, like my phone. I don't need a hundred apps. I just need to make phone calls, maybe check my email, do a few things, uh, but there's all kinds of features that this has that I don't use. Um, so, you know, look around, there's large, small, medium sized ones, uh, different price points, et cetera. And then uh, we've used this before, I think, and I, I just had it out here. So I thought I'd bring it out. If, if you are in more of a hurry, this is just your old school crock pot, right? Where it has a basically a high setting and a low setting. 
and it usually has some form of an insert. This is a ceramic, almost it's got kind of a clear glaze on it. It's like nonstick and it just goes inside. You could take all of these ingredients, put them in the crock pot, no caramelization, no nothing, uh, turn it on low and let it cook overnight and you would have a beautiful cassoulet the next day. So do we develop more flavors when we're doing the caramelization? Um, you know, when you're, you're taking the time to make specialty cuts that leave a product in a certain way prior to service. Yeah, it elevates it a little bit, but will it still taste delicious if everything goes into this and you're even using, uh, you know, uh, rather than fresh vegetables that we cut up in the front end, uh, you could grab a bag of your favorite medley of frozen vegetable or another canned vegetable. There's probably uh, mirepoix, carrot, celery, onion type items in the can section. So uh, lots of different options there to save you time. It just depends on what you're looking for. And then I have two or what I would call two parsleys. This is curly or American parsley. This is what I want to put on at the end. And then this is from uh, Jackie's garden, Jackie Malley's garden. Um, it looks like Italian parsley, but it smells like celery. Um, I apologize, I forgot to get the name, but we did pick up some Italian parsley at uh, the local farm store ourselves and planted it and it grew up like this. And it, it, it was not Italian parsley. It looks like it, but it smells exactly like celery. So uh, it didn't develop the stalks like you would for a celery plant. So I'm not exactly sure what it was or if it's some crossover uh, version. If Jackie's online, she might be able to type in and let us know exactly what it is. But it's not bubble gum. I know it's not bubble gum parsley. <laughs> so all I have to do is pick, uh, pick the, the leaves off. I discarded the stems. Theoretically, honestly, I could throw the stems in and cook it uh, like we've done many times with the herb we use. And then I'm going to cut them up. So I, I always tend to bunch them up a little bit. And then I'm just going to come back and do a really fine cut. I've got a question from Janice. How do you store fresh herbs to make them last? Uh, I, I store them exactly like flowers. So if I were storing this uh, Italian parsley, or excuse me, American parsley, if, if you have stems on it, like this one does, you uh, put them in a little container with water, a damp paper towel, and maybe a light covering of plastic, not really necessary. It depends if you have a fan in your fridge or uh, where you're storing it, but uh, in the refrigerator is best. Um, uh, what we do with the parsley's like this, uh, in the restaurant, you can actually take them and you know, get them nice and wet, wash them clean, put them in a container that has a plastic lid, a damp paper towel, and they'll stay alive for weeks, uh, nice and crisp. But for smaller ones in the home, I usually just put it in a little bit of water in the fridge with a damp paper towel over the top. And you can see I'm not cutting this super fine. I want a little bit of texture to it. All our dry herbs have uh, put the flavor into the dish. So we don't have to worry too much about that. And then this is coming up nice and fine finish chopping these and I'm going to go ahead and mix the two together so we'll get a little flavor of parsley mixed with the celery parsley or whatever it's called and that should work really nice I've got a question from Natalie why aren't garlic press popular among chefs Garlic presses? Yes. Uh, that's a good question. Um, probably because they would take too long, I would think. I mean, if you're only doing a dish like this for you know three, four, five, six people at home and you're pressing a few cloves of garlic, uh, it does work really well. But we, we don't normally cook like this. We're usually doing like two pounds of garlic. And if you were to drop in a clove at a time and try to smash it, it just takes too long. So if we're doing large quantities like that, oftentimes I'll use a food processor. So it depends on the chef, but uh, they do work well. It just depends on what you're looking for. So I see some steam. I don't know if that's steam or smoke, but you can see these are starting to brown up a little bit. Look pretty nice. Getting that moisture off. 
And I'm going to let that go. And let that keep cooking while we, we just wrap up and plate this up. So I'm removing the lid and I can see that it is coming to a boil, making sure I still have fuel here. And there's one other ingredient aside from these herbs and chicken uh, that I want to add. And it's an item that always goes in at the end. If you guys were here, I'd ask someone to raise their hand and tell me what it is. Does anybody know what the what we always put in towards the end? Because if we don't, it tends to cook off the flavor or uh, loses its effectiveness. Salt. Oh, uh, salt is good, but. I have a question from Mary. What is the quantity of the herbs de Provence added to the Cosole? Uh, this is a little bit bigger batch. So I added about a tablespoon, but in the recipe, let's see, what did I put on? A tablespoon. Yeah, so it, it depends on yours. Actually, I have a tiny bit here left. I, I don't measure. I apologize. Uh, we just eyeball it. But um, what I what I did was, as you see, I, I kept a little bit on the side because in putting it in, I'm like, ah, oh, it looks like it might be a little bit too much, but it's not. I just tasted it. The flavor is good, but it can handle that last little bit. And then I added the salt. That's the first time I've added some salt to this. I did salt the Brussels sprouts, but I didn't salt the cassoulet. And it has uh, a really good flavor from that sausage. So all I'm tasting really is the broth, uh, making sure that the broth is right. So when you bite into a sausage, clearly you're gonna get the flavors of the chicken apple sausage or whatever it is you're using. I can now add the chicken. Just stir that in. And those are pretty big kind of rustic chunks I could have chopped it up more, but I, you almost want this to be like a country stew. Uh, imagine yourself sitting in the vineyard. I mean, it's beautiful outside right now, close to sunset. The sun behind us here hitting the buildings and the ocean, it looks great. I just need a glass of sake or wine and uh, close my eyes and pretend I'm traveling. <laughs> I'm just traveling. We were just talking about that today. Hopefully sometime soon. So this is very, very close uh, to what we need. But the answer to the question that I had was not so. Wait, hold on, hold on. I might have two people that have uh, the answer. Mm. It's so good. Yes. Judy, she said vinegar or some um, acidity or Janice, citrus. Yep, those are one and the same, actually. Uh, so okay. some form of acidity. Uh, I prob well, actually, I was going to say, I probably wouldn't use grapefruit juice, but now that I think about it, if you had a grapefruit tree and some fresh grapefruit juice at the end with a little grapefruit fruit zest, this, that would go great with this. Um, but yeah, you need some form of acidity. And as I mentioned earlier, the trick with acidity in items that are hot is that uh, heat will... Uh, oh, it will force the acidity to dissipate very quickly. So you always add your acidity, your fresh squeeze of lemon or lime or a little bit of vinegar or grapefruit, whatever. You always add it just prior to service because if you let it sit and simmer for 20 minutes, 30 minutes or longer, the acidity disappear disappears. It's going to be gone and you'll have to hit it with it again before you serve it. Now, keep in mind, we do have a lot of acidity in this from the tomatoes. Depends on the brand, um, but tomatoes do have a fair degree of natural acidity. And uh, this is almost exactly where I want it, but I do, I am gonna put just a little bit. You don't wanna overdo it so that it becomes a, like a hot and sour soup, but you do want to have uh, that little bit of a bite. So I'm putting in about half a teaspoon. I can always add more but you can't take it away. Well, you can simmer it for a while and it'll go away in this case. But if you look at this now that it's got all of these items in here, hopefully you can see that. The chicken and the sausage and the vegetables and the broth. Um, sounds great. Imagine if some duck was in this, that would be incredible. All right, now I can just get ready to dish that up and then this should be close. Got 
a ladle here. And then I just grabbed one of uh, Paul Nash's nice plates. I believe this was his, uh, donated to the cafeteria. Chef Dan, are you still cooking on medium high? Uh, yeah, I don't know my burner. I keep checking it, you may have noticed, but uh, it doesn't seem to be going as hot as normal. I think the can's almost out. So, but it did finally come to a boil. Usually this cooks really fast. And, and now it's done. Everything's cooked thoroughly. We really just needed to heat up those beans, heat up the tomatoes, heat up the uh, chicken that we added at the, at the end, excuse me. And now we can just dish up, you know, a nice rustic plate of that, a little bit of the fresh parsley and celery on top. Oh my gosh, that, that makes me think I've been in college and I'm 20 years old again. I only, I wish. All right, now I'm gonna pull this out and take a look at it. See if we got some caramelization and browning, which is what we were looking for. I'm certain that it's cooked all the way through. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm noticing here that having the mushrooms in there, mushrooms hold a lot of moisture. So you always have to be careful with that. So that it create a lot of condensation. I can see it inside the, uh, the oven but it'll still work. It's still got the nice and brown, and I'm gonna just dump it out onto this platter. Then I'm gonna to wanna to try to, I'll just pull these peppers up so they look nice and pretty on top. And it can't hurt to hit that with a little bit of the parsley as well. That smells really good. Those mushrooms smell great. All right. So yeah, and, and if you're not staying away from carbs or um, breads, uh, a nice toasted bread with this is what I would uh, recommend. A lot of times, it's just really nice to to dip a little bit of sourdough into the into the broth itself, and that's pretty much it. So kind of a trip down memory lane for me tonight. Hopefully, everybody. Enjoyed it. Are there other questions that we have? Yes. And how how long did you cook uh, in the air fryer? I started it with uh, like nine minutes. So probably in total that went about 18 minutes, probably a little, okay. a little bit less, 17 to 18 minutes. You know, uh, Terry, you Terry wants to know, um, to reduce carbs, could you substitute small cubes of firm tofu for the beans? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, anything you want to utilize in here would be great. Uh, so if you wanted to put tofu in there, that would be awesome. You know what you might even do is, uh, especially if you're using firm uh, tofu, uh, is just put that in the bowl and then ladle the hot uh, cassoulet with no uh, beans in it on top of it. And then as it gets stirred around, that will heat up your, your tofu, uh, if, especially if it's room temperature. If you're putting it in something really hearty like this, even a firm tofu upon stirring it or ladling it out would probably fall apart. So I would just drop it inside. Or even if you imagine having a dish like this currently and then just sprinkling some cubes of chilled tofu. I'm a huge fan of the contrast in temperatures. So if you had a lightly seasoned chilled tofu sprinkled across the top, and you get a little bit of the hot sauce with the cold tofu. I, I just love that sort of thing. So contrast in textures, contrast in temperatures <clears throat> always help elevate a dish to the next level. So great idea. Okay, um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, on a low sodium diet, can citric, citric acid be used in, in, as a substitute? Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, you probably would could could have gotten away with this dish, uh, not adding any sodium at all. Uh, but do check, you know, your canned tomatoes sometimes have salt in them. Uh, beans usually don't, but they may. Uh, your sausage would probably have uh, some salt in it. If you're doing just straight like chicken or duck, uh, meat that's shredded, then you don't have to worry about that. But yeah, absolutely. I would get all of the ingredients together, taste it, see if you need it. And if you do, then yes, you could substitute it. 
uh, with that. And we've talked in the past about some of the sodium substitutes, but um, yeah, a little, a little bit of acidity, honestly, will wake up your tongue uh, and eliminate the need for salt in a lot of cases. Francine wants to know, uh, maybe adding a sliced kale would add to the goodness. Oh, absolutely. Yep, kale. Uh, you know, I look at this and I'm thinking, oh man, they're just, the sky's the limit on the items that you could add to it. Even arugula, if I put fresh arugula, like the little baby arugula, the ones that are, they're really peppery and flavorful um, uh, on top, fresh, even lightly dressed with a couple drops of lemon juice and a couple drops of olive oil, a uh, sprinkle of salt if you, can, if you can have that in your diet on top. So you got like a little salad on there. So with, with each bite, not a lot, not like a big salad on top, but you know, three, four bites that you get the hot sausage with a little bit of salad. And again, that texture combination or contrast and then the temperature uh, contrast would be great. So yeah, I love that you guys are thinking even Brussels sprouts in here would be, would be fine. So there's any, oh, think earthy. This is hearty, earthy, you know, uh, like winter style. We're just coming off the end of winter, but well, we don't really get it here. But if it were snowing outside and it was 20 degrees, this would be great. Either in the vineyard or inside watching the snowfall <laughs> in front of the fireplace, but we don't do that in Hawaii. Well, unless you're up uh, Big Island, up Mauna Kea or something. So. Hey, Dan and Lonnie, can I um, sure. interrupt since we're at the end? Yep. Um, I'm just wondering, if I can take a moment to promote your national program that we're gonna be doing on March 25th. So for folks on the line, if you wanna support Chef Dan in our national member event, which is called AARP Celebrates You, I'll be sending you out a link. It's a little complicated. You actually register for the whole AARP Celebrates You event and you can attend any sessions you want but Chef Dan's session is on the second day of it. And uh, if you click on that link, you can be guided to it. So I'll send it to you in an email, but we would love to have you. It's on March 25th at 10.30 a.m. And it's Secrets of One Pot Cooking. So a little infomercial there for our national debut for this program. Thanks so much. And thanks, Lonnie, and thanks, Chef Dan. Yep, thank you guys, appreciate it. Are there any other questions or? Yes, yeah, so, um, Mary Ann, how much oil was used in the Brussels sprout dish? Yeah, great question, Mary Ann. I think I put eh, just shy of a tablespoon probably. And this is a whole bag. So theoretically, this is about enough for five to six people. Uh, if you're doing it at home, what I normally use at home, but we don't have it here, I ran out. You may have seen it in previous shows is the olive oil spray. So what I do is just put it in the bowl and I, I mist it with the spray. So I t end up using a lot less oil that way. So if you have that at home, it's really convenient. If you just have bottled stuff, probably uh, for a couple people, you'd only use a, uh, a teaspoon, but you just need a little teeny coating. And that's why spray is great because you can, you can coat a pile of Brussels sprouts this big with just one stroke. So you use a lot less. And we were just at the store yesterday shopping for stuff. And there's so many different uh, great oils available in the supermarkets now. And a lot of them are in the spray form. It's not just Pam buttery spray or something like that. It's extra virgin olive oil, different oils in a uh, spray bottle. I have a really quick question about garlic. It's not um, the garlic in this dish. She just wants to know, what's your opinion on garlic roasters? Those hooded things hard to find. Uh, I'm guessing that that's the little thing that like looks like a garlic clove that goes over the top of a, a clove of garlic. Um, I've never used one. Uh, we just use aluminum foil, honestly. So all you're trying to do is trap in the the moisture, but if you have any kind of clay pot or, or even, you know, like the butter dishes that we used to do, uh, that would work. Uh, maybe there's something <laughs> special to the, to the clay or the porcelain that's used in those, I'm not sure. Uh, but anything that's going to enclose it to trap the moisture in there uh, works great. And then you get that caramelization. So 
Uh, I love roasted garlic. It works great. So yeah, you just take the, the whole head, slice the top off, a little bit of oil on top, usually. You could leave that out if you wanted to. <clears throat> I will tend to put a little sprinkle of uh, olive oil, uh, or excuse me, salt and pepper after the oil, and then just wrap it in a couple layers of foil and put it in the oven 400 degrees for 15, 20 minutes. Take it out, let it cool, and it'll soften up, caramelize, and then you just squeeze it and it just like using that um, garlic press that we talked about, but it's a nice soft, uh, we, we turn it into a paste. So basically it sort of is a paste when it comes out, but I love that, it's awesome. Great That's question. it, Sandra said it looks yummy. Thanks Sandra. Mahalo, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Chef Dan, thank you again for a great program. Looks like everybody um, enjoyed it. Mahalo. All right. Everyone have a great night.